we're going to look at team playing styles. Very, this is obviously a very kind of broken down, very simplified version of what actually happens in real life. Uh, playing styles are never this easy to define, but just for the sake of, of today, we're going to break it into four kind of different playing styles. So first of all, you have kind of in the top left, you have kind of physical cerebral teams. So this is a team that is physically very impressive, but also mentally very impressive. Um, on the bottom left, you would look at technical versus cerebral teams. So this is uh, a team which is mentally very good, but technically also very good with the ball. Uh, on the top right, you have physical, creative sort of teams. So teams that might kind of rely on more individual play and kind of special moments, but also they're physically very blessed. And then uh, on the bottom right, you have technical creative teams. Um, so teams that are very good with the ball, just like the teams on the bottom left might be, but they also have the, the creativity and the kind of ability to do something a little bit special. So in Major League Soccer, the physical cerebral team you could maybe define would be the New York Red Bulls. You know, they, they have the high press, play a lot like Liverpool do now and uh, Dortmund and Tottenham. Um, so physically they're very good, but they're also cerebral. They're not just running, it's, um, it's very thought out processes, it's defined movements, there's a very t high tactical side to the game. On the bottom left you might have Columbus Crew in, in Major League Soccer. They're very, very technical, but they're also very tactical. So they roll it out from the back, they try and uh, spread you, they try and create space in between the lines, and they have very purposeful movement on and off the ball to try and create space. On the bottom right, you might have LA Galaxy, who are technically very gifted. You have Giovanni Dos Santos, Robbie Keane, all these sorts of players who can change the game in an instant, but they're also highly creative. They think outside the box. They, uh, they can do something special that no one can see and they can, you know, they can score goals out of nowhere and special goals that some teams just couldn't score. And then on the top right, you might have FC Dallas, who are, again, creative. They have individuals who can do some really special things and turn the game in a moment. But physically, they're also very good. So they rely on pace and power, especially in wide areas. So you can see, just for argument's sake, the further out towards the edge of the box you might go, the more defined your styles are. So we have two expansion teams. They currently don't have a team, so they're in the middle. There are nothing right now. And as a club, the theory is you kind of, and as youth coaches or college coaches or, or whatever you happen to be, I'm sure you have a coaching philosophy and you have a, a playing style that you try and teach your players to work towards. And this is exactly the sort of thing we're talking about. So. In season one, the, the well-run Wildcats hire Harry High Press to be the manager. So Harry wants to press high up the field to win the ball. Uh, he will, you know, they'll look a lot, like I said, like Liverpool, and they'll go direct to goal once they've scored. And the disorganised Devils hire Paul, pass around the back, one of my favourite players. Um, Paul mandates that they, they roll the ball out, they, they try and stretch you and create space in, in areas of the field. So two very different styles of play. So in one season, you know, a club can only go so far. You can't change everything overnight and become the team you want to be in the space of one season unless something very special happens. So season one, both clubs start working towards their goals. Then season two, both teams lose their manager for various reasons. They lose their coach. So Harry moves to DC United and uh, the Wildcats hire his friend Henry Highpress, who plays in a very similar style very similar system, not really too much turnover and not really too much change at the club during this time. However, the disorganised Devils decide to have a change of heart a little bit and they hire Frank Freestyle. And uh, Frank wants to give the players a bit more freedom. He wants them to express themselves. You know, maybe they start looking a little bit more like uh, the LA Galaxy team that we just talked about. So uh, over the course of this season, you know, the Devils kind of change their direction a little bit while the Wildcats um, carry on moving towards their goal. Uh, season three, you, I'm sure you get the idea. Uh, no coaching changes, so both teams kind of move again towards the goal. And then season four, uh, the well-run Wildcats lose their coach again, hire a very similar coach, a very similar methodology, 
and uh, again move towards the kind of collective goal that they they highlighted before. Whereas the disorganized devils, and this is you know in the name, I'm sure you can guess, it's not that it's not that hard to figure out. Are disorganized. They don't know as a team what they want to do as an organization, and that's what you find with uh, with many organizations that see a lot of turnover at the top. Is you you almost get nothing uh, because you spend so much time changing, and change takes time and change takes money. That you actually you end up kind of staying right where you were. Where teams that kind of retain the same methodology and the same systems in place start making progress towards their goals. So as you can see, the Wildcats have managed to kind of catch up to the Red Bulls and they're, they're really doing what they set out to do on season one. And the Devils, due to their disorganization, have essentially uh, just gone round in circles. So as, just to think about some things that might be going on during the club at this time. So the Wildcats, like I said, they've retained their culture. They've retained their playing style throughout the four years. And as an academy coach in this system. On you know, year one, you sit down with a head coach, you talk about training the players, you talk about developing culture and philosophy um, and tactical principles to your players. And for four years, you've been able to uh, coach these things the, the same way. So a U13 player in the Houston Dynamo, for example, academy system for four years has been coached the same system the same, you know, the way you want to press, the same tactical movements, the same culture, the same phrases that coaches use. Um, so by the age of 17, he's had four years of reinforcement on this. Uh, the sports science department, they, uh, they set up their fitness programs and their, their kind of culture and their processes to, you know, prevent injuries and ensure peak fitness. These have stayed the same for the last four years. And the recruitment department, which is something that I... Um, I personally am involved with at Houston um, in year one. Again, you set up your parameters for what you want from a certain player, how you want them to react on and off the ball, if they're good with the ball, or if you need them to be fast, you know, whatever, whatever you want to look for, for your players, you spend four years looking for the same players. So when, one, when you trade one, when one gets transferred abroad, whatever happens, you have a good fit of a player ready to come in. On the other hand, if you take yourself and you put yourself in the position at the, uh, the disorganized devils as an academy coach, the sessions you planned in year one are you know, useless in year two and useless in year three. And as a player in the academy system, at the age of 13, you're being told to, to press high and you're learning triggers of when to press and when to drop off and what expectations are from you. And then in year two, you get a new coaching style, a new philosophy. Now you're being asked to roll it out the back and you're asked to be a lot more methodical. So all the lessons learned in year one, you're now being told to unlearn and learn some new lessons and start developing in a new direction. And then year three and year four, a new direction. And development is, is stunted and you are, you know, you're confusing these kids and you can't, you can't realistically create a player in the youth development system that is the best they can possibly be in a high pressing system and in a system where you might want to roll the ball out the back and then in a system more like Dallas where you might want to counter attack teams. It's, it's counterintuitive and it's just not realistic. So you end up developing players who, you know, in the end, when they become 18, 19, 20, are lesser players than what they could have been had they had the same reinforcement over the four years. Same with the sports science department, like we mentioned before. There's different energy systems you need to use. There's different types of stretches. There's different checks that you need to do. There's a physical demands change on players. Then the, the demands of the sports science department change with it. And same in recruitment. You know, you, if you switch playing style three times in four years as a recruitment department, the, the central midfielder who you kind of dismissed and decided was no good to you three years ago suddenly is a great fit. And, you know, you've passed on this player, you've missed your opportunity to sign a player. And in the end, for a club, this obviously takes up a lot of time. Uh, changing all the way you work and changing your systems and changing your feedback process and all these things that change within a club when the philosophy changes takes a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. You know, you need to buy new equipment, you need to buy new software. You 
you lose coaches, you have to fire coaches, all these things that happen that cost the club money, and eventually that leads to points. You know, um, I don't think it's any surprise that just to take a, a real world, you know, maybe more famous example, you take, uh, for example, Tottenham or Liverpool, who have been moving towards the same style of play over the last few years and signing the right players and developing players through their academy. And you see them thriving on so-called lesser budgets. And then you see Manchester United, who are, you know, they go from David Moyes to um, Louis van Gaal to Jose Mourinho. And, you know, they're signing four, five, six new players every transfer window to try and fix the mess. 